Assalamu alaikum. This podcast is brought to you by Seekers Guidance. Support us in spreading free, reliable Islamic knowledge to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Make a small donation at seekersguidance.org forward slash donate. As little as $10 a month can go a long way. How do we inculcate certainty that our du'as will be answered? It's very simple. <clears throat> First, understand what Du'as being answered means And then uh, Bear this in mind So a du'a is not uh, An Amazon order right? You can go into Amazon <clears throat> Order You know some food Some uh, Supplements you know, Health supplements And they'll arrive at your door The next day or within a few days And if they don't come You can cancel your order You can complain to Amazon It's not like that Dua is an expression of slavehood It's saying, oh Allah, you're the master, I'm the slave You have said, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Your Lord has said, um, call your loving Lord, caring, generous Lord has said Call upon me, I will answer you I will answer you He didn't say, I will give you exactly what you want when you want it So as one of the righteous said, uh, Sayyidi Ahmad ibn Ata'illah al-Sakandari radiallahu anhu, he said, <coughs> um, <clears throat> uh, even if you're persisting in dua and really pleading and begging, oh Allah, give me this. And he said, don't, uh, don't let you not getting what you want a means of losing hope. Even if you're persisting in dua, just because you've asked it, it doesn't mean that it's good for you, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, عَجِبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ إِنَّ أَمْرَهُ كُلَّهُ لَهُ خَيْرٍ The hadith in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet said, I'm amazed at the affair of the believer. Whatever happens to him is the best thing for him. So, when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if what you're asking for is not good for you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't give it to you. It's as simple as that. Sometimes you ask for something which um, in the moment you're in or the situation you're in, this thing would not be good for you. However, maybe a year or two years down the line, it will be good for you. Right? So, Sayyidi Ahmad ibn Ata'illah said, فَهُوَ ضَمِنَ لَكَ الْإِجَابَةِ Allah has guaranteed a response to you. أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Call on me, I will certainly respond. So he's guaranteed a response. And the wording in Arabic, <coughs> really, you know, it's a really strong word to affirm. Yes, I will, I will wholeheartedly respond. You could say. So he said, "Lakin, <coughs> lakin fi maktarahu laka la ma taktarahu li nafsik." But he'll respond with what he chooses for you. He knows you best. He knows your future. He knows what will help you get to paradise in the best way. That's your ultimate interest. So. What he chooses for you, that's the response you get. Not what you choose for yourself. And it will come to you in the time he wants, not at the time you want. Sometimes you want, you know, I mean, let's face it. <coughs> when we ask, it's a case of, you know, if if it was a case of us getting whatever we wanted, whenever we wanted, most people's dua would be everything now. <laughs> so... Sometimes things are not good for you in the moment Or sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to train you Rabbul Alameen, the one who trains and takes people from one stage to a higher stage right, To, the, to get to this point So, I mean, some of the people who have the greatest iman in, in the ummah What's their approach, right? Oh Allah, you choose for me And everything, you choose They ask out of slavehood to express their slavehood But whatever Allah gives, they're happy, right? They choose So, okay, so it's uh, Allah will respond. How? I'll talk about in a second. Uh, he will respond with what he chooses, what's best for you, and at a time he chooses. That's the response. So in the hadith, uh, we know that the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'll give you the rough meaning, that whenever you ask, <coughs> whenever you ask Allah for something, either you get what you ask for, right? And as I said, if that happens, it's in the way Allah wants, and or what Allah wants uh, And at a time of his choosing But either you get what you ask for Or An equivalent amount of harm Is pushed away from you Maybe 
you know, <clears throat> you want that job <clears throat> or you want to marry that individual or whatever. And it's the most important thing in your life to you. Maybe you don't get that, but something just as important and just as significant uh, uh, in, its, um, <clears throat> in its role in your life is protected for you. Yeah. So, you know, um, <clears throat> let's say someone has one child and they really want another child. And, you know, maybe it's destined that the first child that they have is meant to die. And they're constantly praying, oh, Allah, give me another child, give me another child. And they don't get the other child, but Allah changes the lifespan of the first child for the, so they live longer. Right? Or you want a job, you don't get the job, but you're meant to have an accident uh, <clears throat> that would leave you in hospital for months and it doesn't happen. You don't get into that accident. Right? So either you get what you want or something equally equal in uh, importance of the harm of bad is deflected from you or your supplication is saved until the day of judgment and this is what you should understand you want to have a good opinion of Allah Allah will certainly give yeah understand this <clears throat> that every time you ask Allah oh Allah give me this oh Allah give him this oh Allah give so and so this every time you ask Allah know you're going to benefit from the asking Either you get or they will get or some harms turned away or you'll face it, you'll see on the Day of Judgment. There'll be people who see the equivalent of mountains of reward on the Day of Judgment. And they'll be in shock, like, where on earth has all this come from? I didn't do anything to deserve this. <clears throat> and then the angels will say, <clears throat> you asked for such a such a thing. You know, that th there are people who ask for things for years and it doesn't come. But what happens? they'll see the fruits of it there. And the angel will say, you asked for such and such a thing. It wasn't given to you then. It was saved for the Akhirah. And here it is. And there'll be people who see so much reward. And imagine the things that you really wish for now, but they don't come. You will also wish for things in the Akhirah. And there'll be things that you desire in the Akhirah and you get them and much, much more. And even that thing you wanted in the dunya, if you got it on a scale of 1 to 100, the happiness you felt after getting it might have been 30. But uh, when you get what you want in the akhirah on the scale of 1 to 100, it'll be infinite, <laughs> right? It will surpass all your expectations, all your desires. <coughs> all your desires will be fulfilled. So how uh, do you inculcate certainty that our du'as will be answered? No. Whenever you ask Allah, He's giving you something, whether you see it now or you see it later in life or you see it on the Day of Judgment, it comes. There's a guaranteed response. The response, though, will be dependent on whether it's good for you or not. And, you know, it's it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing you a favor. Like, imagine someone, you know, <clears throat> someone wants to go and try some drugs, for example. He goes to a drug dealer and the drug dealer knows, okay, let's say he's got some morality in him. And the drug dealer knows, you know, this person's father or brother. And the guy says, here, you know, he made some drugs and the drug dealer actually gives him a slap and says, go away. You know, you don't, you don't want this stuff, right? He's doing him a favor. He might be whacking him, but he's doing him a favor, isn't he? He's doing what's in his ultimate benefit. So it's not quite like that, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does what's best for us. So apologies for the long-winded answer, but um, there is some detail to this. Okay, so Allah bless you. Is it improper to ask for something very specific? And after seeing that Allah has taken that thing away from you, should you stop asking Allah for it? Okay, so A, it's not improper to ask for something <coughs> specific. <coughs> Rather, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Call on me, I will surely answer you. So ask Allah for anything and everything. As long as it's halal and you're not uh, praying for some wrongdoing to occur to someone else, <clears throat> ask Allah, ask away, right? It's an act of worship. It's the very essence of worship because the person who you turn to uh, in your greatest need is the one you know who you believe can do anything, right? So that's Allah. So ask away. So asking for specific things, <clears throat> fine. What if you don't get it? Keep asking. You will always benefit from it. But <clears throat> we should train ourselves to 
accepting the response of Allah, trying to resist and struggle. And I keep wanting this. I keep asking, why isn't it coming? I went and did, you know, a hajj and I asked and it didn't come. And I went and gave charity and it didn't come. Don't resist. Ask with the intention. I'm going to ask my master if he deems this good for me and gives it to me. I will do my best to thank him. And if he deems that it's not good for me, he doesn't give it to me, I will say, you know, I will do my best to thank him. I'll say, Alhamdulillah. That's the attitude. So ask for your specific thing. Sometimes um, Allah turns a thing away from you. Like if you prayed uh, the Salat al-Istikhara, you've asked for something and then problems occur whilst you're pursue, whilst you're pursuing it. Alamatu tawfiq at as the righteous say, that <clears throat> the sign that there's success, that there's... Um, God-given success in something is that it's made easy. So if you're pursuing a spouse and problem one comes up, you fix that. Problem two, problem three, problem four. There's a sign here, which means it's not good for you. So with the istikhara, people think, I need to see a dream. I need to see green. I need to see... Forget all of that. Forget your feelings. If you've done the istikhara, Allah will make the best happen. So look at a situation, pros and cons, make a decision, pray the istikhara, and then pursue. If it works out, excellent. If it doesn't work out, it's bad for you, Allah's turning it away. <clears throat> Once you see something has been turned away from you, then, you know, treat it as, <clears throat> you know, uh, the wrapper to a chocolate bar you've eaten. You've had the chocolate, and meaning you've asked, and now what you can do with the, the wrapper, right? You can't do much with it, so throw it into a bin <laughs> over your shoulder and forget about it. If it's not coming to you, it's not meant to come, come to you. And this is one of the best ways of actually even drawing closer to Allah, you know, uh, letting him choose for you. And it can be hard, but that's where the benefit comes from. Should we refrain from giving that word to people who are highly unlikely to accept Islam? Uh, as they will be held accountable once they have received the message. So for us, if someone is capable of explaining Islam properly and the situation is available, then you should tell them. You should tell them. Even if they're highly unlikely, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala... <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> look, I, I know of a situation where someone, <clears throat> there was a convert, he was a Hindu convert, and he went and spoke to his grandmother. She was really elderly, and she was like, uh, you know, 80s, and, you know, um, her memory wasn't quite what it was. She couldn't grasp things as well. And he tried explaining to her that God is one. And she said to him, like, I wish you hadn't told me, like, I don't know what to do with this right now. She couldn't process it. So if she's never come across this concept, and she can't process it, because one of the conditions <clears throat> of this is that for the message to be delivered, the person has to hear the message and understand the message or read it and understand it as, as long as it's delivered and understood. So if that hasn't happened, then they're not likely to be punished on the Day of Judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like Imam al-Ghazali and others have said that, you know, Allah will pardon those who, who the message of Islam hasn't reached or if a distorted message has reached them. So... If, <clears throat> if this person can't understand it, then inshallah they'll be excused. But <clears throat> if there is a person who's capable of knowing, understanding, processing it, we should tell them. It's our responsibility. And if you don't, you may be, <coughs> you may be questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> or the person may come to you on the day of judgment. Why didn't you tell me about Islam? And you can say, well, I didn't think you'd be interested. Well, maybe I would have, they might say. They might say, maybe I would have gone away and thought about it. So if you have the opportunity, you have the requisite understanding, tell them. And, you know, we're not on a recruitment drive and you don't get a commission. Well, you do actually, you do get commission rewards, but it's not, <clears throat> it's not something that if you fall short on, you're going to get a question. You didn't, you didn't manage to convert 5,000 people in your lifetime. No. Rather, it, telling people about Islam comes from a place of concern. We want them to have the best in this life and the next. Best in this life with a heart that's thriving with love for Allah and His Messenger and you know, applying the rules of Islam. And if it's not applied properly, that can that's a different discussion, but applying the rules of Islam. So <clears throat> this concern for them, and you also want to save from the hellfire, which will come from them 
you know, recognizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his true message. <coughs> so <clears throat> that's where it is. So it's not a case of I want them in my club. So all you have to do is you have to tell them and leave the rest to them and Allah. As long as you convey the message properly, you've done your part. And so this is like if you have non-Muslim friend, friends, then, you know, just bring up the conversation and speak to them. It doesn't have to be in this really, um, <clears throat> you know, elaborate way. Sometimes just planting a seed is sufficient, you know. And I, I used to work with, uh, I used to work in a store and there was a manager and <clears throat> he was a young man, a few years older than me. And <clears throat> he didn't, you know, he, it's like, it's clear he didn't have much of a, uh, concern for religion so one day it was raining outside no one's coming in we just stood around so i said so do you believe in god and <clears throat> and then he said no not really but he said although um he said minan his, his grandmother <clears throat> his maternal grandmother he said she was in hospital that day and i remember driving back thinking please let her get better please let her be all right please let her be all right and i said that's god you're talking to there and which is this, the fitra. So it got him thinking. And <clears throat> in the same workplace, there was uh, a man, I don't know if I left before him or he left before me. There was a man and he was an old, old man, maybe in his 50s, uh, Rastafarian with long dreadlocks, white hair, he was going old. And we got talking and he was very, very keen on uh, you know learning more about Islam and possibly entering Islam so if you think well maybe they won't be interested you don't know <clears throat> and you know look how the prophets approached it it's a duty I will tell them but you know there are conditions and requisites but that's the, the broad gist of it what are the signs that I am sincere in, in seeking knowledge uh, so the first thing is make your mind up Right, you know, to be sincere, go find a place, private place, no one there, and with your heart turn to Allah. Oh Allah, I want to seek knowledge of this religion for your sake. I want to do uh, this act of worship to please you. And make that bond and that pact with Allah. Remember, building your relationship with Allah is very important because you're seeking this knowledge to please Allah. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't in your life and all you're seeing is fiqh books and aqidah books and hadith books and you know and so on. <clears throat> That sincerity is not going to come. So build a relationship, recite some Quran, <coughs> listen to the scholars who <coughs> talk about, you know, uh, spirituality, directing yourself to Allah, making Allah the main focus of your life. That will ensure that sincerity spreads and permeates to everything else. So in seeking knowledge. And then um, <coughs> I remember there was, there's a beautiful point. Uh, Imam Dawood at Ta'i. So he's an amazing scholar and in many of the chains of many spiritual paths, he's one of the highest scholars. And he was a direct student of Imam Abu Hanifa, who was a master of outward and inward sciences, inward knowledge. And so <clears throat> Abu Hanifa once said to him, Ammal ala faqad atqannaha. As for the tool, the means of drawing closer to Allah, knowledge, we've perfected it, he's saying. So Dawood al Ta'i said to him, For ma baqi, so what's left now? If you've mastered that, he said, al uh, biha, uh, applying it, applying that knowledge. So <clears throat> Imam Dawood al Ta'i, what he did, he went to uh, his classes with Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa's teaching style was unique. He taught to build people up, as is the Sunnah of, Prophet, of the Prophet, وسلم, to teach people so they can become uh, independent. Uh, with the confident in their knowledge, which has a sound basis, <clears throat> he didn't want people that were just, you know, he didn't want uh, people that thought we've sold our soul to him, and we have to do everything he says all the time. No, he was building them to be independent. So uh, he had 36, 40, 40 people that were mujtahids in his class. He was training them, asked them a question, "What do you think the answer is to this?" Listen to their answers. Uh, then take their answers and then ref refute them, give his answer or support their answer. So he was training them. And <clears throat> you can, a, a very engaging intellectual environment. So Imam Dawood al Ta'i, for sincerity, what he did is he sat there 
for an entire year not speaking. And you can imagine someone in this environment, you know, I've been in similar environments, it's very engaging and it's really intellectually stimulating, you know, talking and asking questions. He said, I'm not going to ask a sing, I'm not even going to talk. Huge, huge act of mujahada, you know, um, <clears throat> fighting his uh, egotistical in uh, instincts <clears throat> just for sincerity. So in our times, the first thing you can do, if you're a student of knowledge, go and delete those social media accounts. No Facebook, no Twitter, uh, no Instagram, nothing. TikTok, get off it all. And six, seven, eight years, whatever, books. And only when Allah puts you in a situation to go on social media and benefit people, only then. And, you know, I resisted for a long time. And then I was, you know, it, it came to me from a number of sources, a um, <clears throat> number of people saying, you should, you should, you should. And that's only then that I start. <coughs> and even now, I, I, I sparingly use social media. And there's some platforms I just, I don't like. I just stay away from completely because of uh, the nature of in the type of discussion, arguments and stuff like that. <coughs> so <clears throat> get off social media. So make a firm uh, decision in your heart to be sincere to Allah. Turn to Allah and worship Him. Develop your bond with Allah. So you can be sincere um, and <clears throat> learn about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Develop your knowledge <coughs> and develop your adab, your behavior, your character. They say that, uh, you know, the equivalent, what's the equivalence between the two? They say your knowledge should be like, uh, I forgot the actual statement, but uh, let's just put it, uh, let me paraphrase it or put it in it. Your knowledge should be like the salt you put on the food. And your adab should be like the rest of the food, right? A lot more. So, you know, don't just focus on, you know, learning facts. Focus on the way the Prophet was, his character, the way he behaved. And these are the means, inshallah ta'ala. And that's, you know, when you do this, you'll come under the rubric of uh, one of the uh, the righteous. He said, um, <clears throat> So we sought knowledge. <clears throat> he said, we sought knowledge for other than Allah with ulterior motives, but knowledge refused to be for anyone but Allah, meaning they sought the knowledge and they kept them sincere because they were sincere and wanting to seek it. So stay away from arguments, <coughs> stay away from fame, notoriety. Idfin wujudaka fi ardil khumul, as Sidi ibn Atayla said, bury your existence in the ground of obscurity where you're not known. Because <coughs> something that's not <coughs> very sorry about this cough, I can't do anything about it. He said something that <coughs> that's not a seed that's not buried benefit that's not buried properly, it doesn't grow properly. So if you know you're seeking knowledge and then you know you're there posting, oh that's a nice fancy quote, I'll put that up, I'll get some likes. Oh that's a that's an interesting fact, I'll put it up, I'll get some likes. If that's all you're doing, then <clears throat> you may find <clears throat> you only have the likes to show for on the day of judgment. So developing that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah knows best. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us all sincerity. You know, no one's, you know, you know it's, it's a big need for everyone. How can, uh, how can I be sure my khuffain are suitable to walk a farsakh? Uh, like I said last week, any thick socks or walking socks are sufficient right and if you really want to be sure put them on leave your shoes off and go walk four miles <laughs> if they don't tear or come off they're all right what did you mean when you said uh, let allah choose that's exactly what i meant <clears throat> in the sense that you ask for something oh allah uh, you know give me this and then whatever the response comes or whatever things turn out as you say i accept this and you don't try and fight it. No, no, I really want the other thing. Oh, Allah, please, why not? Do no, this is what's happened. I'm fine with it. That's that's the appropriate. Is it improper to play the Quran when no one's listening to it in the in the background when no one's listening to it? Uh, and does this recitation of the Quran ward off the shaitan? So yes, it's impermissible to play the Quran or recite the Quran <clears throat> out loud when no one's going to be listening to it. That's not permissible. <coughs> Someone who turns away and ignores it is uh, is sinful. Um, so, so therefore, do not recite the Quran 
uh, in a in a place where people are busy with something else. Don't go to the you know to the middle of the you know uh, city center you know where people walk around and you know they go there to relax and then just sit there and start reciting the Quran out loud. They may not have come for that. And you know even in the masjid, people might want to <coughs> people might want to pray or make dhikr. And if you're reciting the Quran, they can't do their worship. Keep it silent. Um, there's a recitation of the Quran word of shaitan absolutely reciting the Quran will you know um, <clears throat> has a tremendous effect and sometimes people uh, benefit so much from the Quran that the shaitan doesn't want to come near them because of the benefit they receive from the Quran but generally we know from the hadith that someone who recites um, <clears throat> various things so like Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah uh, Ali Imran the recitation of these uh, surahs keeps the shaitan away from buildings and houses so that's something you could do so I want to be a student of knowledge I want to be a scholar or you know, slash student of knowledge would you recommend first I exhaust all means in my current location before leaving absolutely <coughs> before I went uh, to Syria, um, I had uh, I had a great deal of Arabic behind me. I had done my fardain, I had learned fiqh, I had learned aqidah, um, I would read uh, a lot of books that were available at the time, um, but I had a lot of Arabic behind me. And you know, I, I, when I went uh, to Syria, it was mostly for the you know speech. Um, I studied a lot of grammar there. Uh, in a very short time because I had a, a background in it, a lot of surf. And I found there were people there with nothing. They came just like blank slates and then they wanted to sit in a classroom uh, for three or four months to do a course <coughs> so that someone could explain daraba, daraba, darabu, darabat to them, the basic conjugation of the the, the past tense uh, words in, in Arabic. And had they sat down at home with someone, they could have learned it in 15 minutes. So do what you can in your current place. There's a lot you can learn online. And um, <clears throat> absolutely. So do that before going elsewhere. Thank you for listening. This podcast was brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the global Islamic seminary. Visit seekersguidance.org to access reliable Islamic knowledge taught by qualified teachers. We offer a wide range of courses, podcasts, articles, and a world-class answer service. Support us in spreading free, reliable Islamic knowledge to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Visit seekersguidance.org forward slash donate and make a small monthly commitment today. Our beloved Prophet wasallam said, Whoever guides someone to goodness will have a similar reward. So don't forget to share this podcast and spread prophetic guidance.